First John chapter 3 this evening. Brother Dan, it's your fault. You're the one who said morning to me a little bit. We're going to be at First John chapter 3 this evening, and we're going to be doing verses 1 and 2. And John writing is uh, this, as we, we're going to see next week, he's going to spend uh, his time talking about, uh, again, the, the topic of, or he's going to be talking about those that are truly in the Lord, those who are truly following the Lord, uh, or those, basically those that are truly saved have, uh, will walk in the truth. They don't walk in sin, they don't continue in sin. But these first two verses, he talks about uh, the uh, love of God is basically a very short version of uh, his salvation message. He talks about the love that is bestowed upon us, uh, just that we are made God's uh, children, and that there is a great blessing that is coming from that. And so I kind of wanted to, or kind of, not kind of, but I wanted to break these up as I really think that uh, there's, it's basically these verses, they kind of all go together. Of course, they always go together, but the temptation for me was to try and do them all at once, but I felt like there was too much to do in one lesson, so we're dividing it up uh, just to try and spend a little bit more time in each place. So let's go ahead and read uh, the two verses that we're going to be doing tonight. It's 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are, are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have to be here this evening, Lord. Thank you so much for this time we have to study your word and to uh, worship your name, Lord. I pray that you would open our hearts to your word. Please apply it to us that we can um, learn from it, we can grow from it, Lord, that it would take seed in our hearts and in our lives. I pray that you would guide and direct me as I share your word, and not be my words, but it would be yours. And that everything would be for your honor, your glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. First thing he says, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. He uh, makes this statement here, uh, talking about the love of the Father. And the first thing we see, the very first word here, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath. Uh, this word, behold, it, it means to be aware, to know. He's, he's calling them to uh, look at it, consider what has been given unto us. This is not something to be taken lightly. This is not something that is of um, low value. This is... The greatest thing that has ever happened to the face of the world. This is the greatest gift that God has bestowed upon us. There are many, many things that the Lord does for us. One of the things I think about, try to think about from time to time, is all the things that the Lord has His hand in that we just don't realize that He does. Now, I think that when we're in heaven later on, there's going, there may be things that are revealed to us that we're just going to be in awe of the hand of God in our lives. But you know, the greatest gift that He has bestowed upon us, He's told us about it very clearly. We have access to it. We have the uh, promise of it. And it's something for us to consider. It's something for us to take very seriously. Not just for, of course, with the context of salvation, the need is for those that are lost to consider it uh, very deeply for their need of it. But even after salvation, we need to remember that gift. We need to think upon it to go back to that moment. Because it is a wondrous gift. It's something to not just sweep under. You know, we really, I think we need more positive. 
positivity in our lives. I know I do, oftentimes. And there is always something for us to be positive about when we have Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. The love that God has for us and what He has bestowed upon us is always something to consider and to be joyful for. He says, Behold, what manner of love. He says here, What manner. Uh, he's, he's basically saying, Of what possible sort of, of what kind. It, it, it's so great of an act. It's, it's so great of a love that He had for us. And in some ways, it, in some cases, it may not even make sense. The amount of mercy that He bestows upon us, the amount of grace that He's given to us. You, know, you would think that at some point His love would grow thin and He would stop having His mercy on us. But it doesn't run out. To some it could seem as it can, it can seem too easy that it's just given to us. That there's nothing we have to do for it. But it is free. It is given to us. It is great. One of a kind. There's nothing like it. Really, we, we try to come up with ways of drawing an illustration between God's love for us and other examples that we may have. But really, God's love for us should be the illustration for everything else. There's nothing else that really that comes anywhere near as close to what God's love is. What actions He has taken because of His love. Truly the greatest. The actions that he's taken, taken. And this, he talks, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. This word, love is the agape love. The greatest of all in the Greek language. Or the strongest love in the Greek language. It's a love that we see in John 3.16. We've seen it elsewhere in 1 John as well. But this is the love He has for us, the ultimate love. And the Father has chosen to bestow upon us many things because of that love. And to bestow upon us His love. God is to bestow means to give a gift, basically to provide of one's own accord. You know, this is something about it. God has poured all of this upon us because He wants to. Of course, His love drives Him to that. And but he, he has made this decision. Well, they twisted His arm. When they forced Him into it, He chose. And because of it, it says... He makes us, He bestows this upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Because of His love for us, because of His great and powerful or great and amazing love, He makes us to be His children. When we see here in our King James when it says the sons of God, the Greek word for sons means child. It's not talking about just boys or just men. This is His children. We're able to become a part of the family of God. We're able to be a part of something that is the greatest family of all. Oh, there are so many that have broken families, that have hurt families. I mean, even those that are not what we consider to be really bad families are not perfect families. All parents and all children have their own problems because they're sinful. I love my family. I enjoy spending time with them, but there are many things they do, and that I do, that cause a lot of problems. They're not all that exciting. But being a part of the family of God, having God as our Father, He 
is a perfect father to us. The things that he does for us, the plans that he has, the way that he guides us, Another thing to remember as well, when we become a child of God, once we have placed our trust and faith in Him and we become a child of Him, we cannot be disowned either. You know, there are some times where family members disown each other or leave each other or ignore each other, but God will never do that. He'll never turn away from us. Never ignore us. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. God, who is rich in mercy, he's rich in his mercy for us, which is him forgiving uh, us of a debt that we owe him. Not being held accountable to something that we deserve. He's rich in mercy. There's abundance of it. And because of his love, his love is so great, even when we were dead in our sins, he came along. Romans 5 8, but God committed his love towards us, and that yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We see elsewhere that God had all of it planned before the creation of the world. He made the decision when there is is and was nothing for us to offer. When he knew that there was no way for us to pay it back. You know, you go to a bank and you try to get a loan. If you don't have any kind of income, if you don't have any proof that you're going to be able to pay back the loan, if you don't have anything to put up for collateral, chances are pretty slim of them giving you anything. They want to know that they're getting it back. They want to know that you have something to offer them. Even then, they still got to make something off of it. God does not get anything from us. There's nothing we can offer Him to get out of our sins, to become worth something. We are worth something because of God. That's why He says, that he hath quickened us together with Christ. He brought us out of death. He brought us to life. God does not save us out of an obligation to us. He saves us because he wants us to be with him. He wants us to be his children. He wants it so much that he refuses to reject anybody that comes to them, as long as you come on his terms, as long as you come through Christ. He has the path that you come to him, and you can only come to him through that path, but any that come to him, because of his love for us, there are no requirements. Just come. We don't have to change the sins. Now, as John is going to talk later on as we're going to see when we continue through this chapter. He does make it very clear that those after God, after becoming children of God, do change their lives. But you don't have to change anything in order to come to Him. You change when you're with Him. When he says that we are quickened together with Christ, this word quickened means to reanimate, to make alive. What happens when we come to God, when we become children of God through grace? It brings 
brings us to our actually being alive. One of the popular things right now is zombies, the, the walking dead and such. Those without God, without the saving grace of Christ, are the walking dead. Dead in your sins. But through Christ, we can brought, be brought into a real life. As we continue in verse 1, or verse 1, he says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. You know, there is a natural division that occurs, though, when we uh, reap, when we seek the Lord, when we become his children. We see here that he tells us that the world knoweth us not. It says the world here is speaking to those that are living in the, the society of the world, the, the, just the people itself, the life of sin. Those that are still dead in their sins. He tells us that these people, they don't know us. They don't understand us. They can't. Because they do not know the Father. What makes us different, what changes us is the Father. And if they don't know Him, then they don't know why we've changed. They don't understand the changes that have been made. They do know the existence of God, though. Romans 1 and 20 tells us, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, they, they very well do know of His existence. A creation itself tells them of that. I think that even history, seeing all of the many gods and idols throughout history, many of them take on the attitudes of either animals of creation or gods of certain parts of creation. Because the, the creation itself tells people of his existence, but it does not show them exactly who they are, who he is, to be able to know. That comes from coming to them. But these people, they don't want to actually know the Father. They don't actually want to grow close to Him. Because they reject Him. Because they do not want to reject their own wisdom. Their own knowledge. Their own desires. So they do not have a close relationship with Him. They don't truly understand Turn over to the, book, uh, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. You know, these people, they do not understand us because they do not know the Father, Christ. Kind of talked about this a little bit more, this division that would take place. John chapter 15, verse 18, he says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth. Those that are children of God, they do not want to listen to the Father. They do not want to listen to those things. They want to be themselves. They want to follow their own things. And so they will not enjoy 
the things of us. They will not love those things. They will not care for those things. They will have no desire to even learn them. 